My guest today, once a summa cum laude graduate, is an American educator, a legislator, an artist, and founder of the Light in Winter Festival in Ithaca, New York. She's also an entrepreneur with international presence, a family-oriented person, and a community-focused personality in Ithaca. She has over 35 years of international consulting experience in the areas of leadership and management development and implementation of organizational change. She has an amazing diverse range of accomplishments. For example, she's a member of Leaders Excellence Harvard Square, a member of Buffalo Society of Artists and Western New York Artists Group. She has the Lifetime Achievement Award from Cornell Ithaca Town Gown Awards. She served in legislative and executive positions in government and news media. And she won the AP Award for Program on Ethics of Journalism, just to mention a few. She's also specialized in many areas, such as management communication, interpersonal communication, intercultural communication, and persuasion. As a senior lecturer of the faculty, Marketing and Management Communication at the prestigious Cornell University Johnson Graduate School of Management, she works with master students, but also with specialized master students abroad, namely as a visiting professor at ECSP Europe in Paris, but also at the AVT School of Business in Copenhagen, Denmark. Thanks God we have her also in the corporate world because she also conducts webinars on intercultural issues for executives around the world. With her exceptional leadership skills through her successful experience in the public, private and non-profit sectors, She's not only perceived from her colleagues and companions as an immensely intelligent and cultured woman, but also as an approachable and collaborative person. In other words, she's just fantastic. <laughs> Welcome, Professor Barbara Ming. Thank you, Juliana. That is really lovely. It was so interesting hearing this overview. Yes. I, must, I must hasten to assure your audience, I don't do all those things at the same time. This was and, my history unfolding. And so, there are more, and there are more. Oh, so no. We are so happy to have you here in I'm the Asia region, and also people listening from the MENA region. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. You are actually what the world needs. We need you, especially nowadays, because you are just a great communicator. And there are so many communication difficulties around the world. I think it's just the best time to talk about what you really teach and all the differences and areas as mentioned before. But can I please ask you before we dive in to the whole communication areas, but then you can share with us your backstory because you have also mm. an interest in childhood and uh, and also the combination um, teaching communication and at the same time being an abstract painter. I would like to know more about your backstory. Sure. Of course. Um, well, the first thing I think to acknowledge is that I'm part of one of the luckiest generations when I was growing up, it felt like one could you could follow your own passion and somehow end up with a job by chance that would sustain you throughout your life. So when I was growing up in Buffalo, New York, um, I thought I was going to be an English professor. And uh, I haven't really done that, but what changed my life in a very important way was being an exchange student uh, in high school. So my last year of high school, I graduated early and my last year I spent in Switzerland. I had taken high school French, but I spent it in German Switzerland. 
So there was a real difficulty in terms of language, especially because German Switzerland is, they speak uh, something called Schweizerdeutsch, which is a, a dialect. Correct. Yeah. yeah. So learning the experience there, first of all, of having the curtain rise after three months and my being able to understand and communicate. I have a, a pretty good ear, I think, so that helped. But being able to speak to people in their own language made all the difference, especially for a 17 year old, when having friends is more important than almost anything else. Yes, exactly. So, yeah. That was already and, the first challenge. Yes, exactly. It, it was the first challenge and an unexpected one, but I pushed through. And coming back was the most shocking in a way because having lived in Europe, simple as that, made me realize how huge the world was and how uh, the American attitude then during the 70s was very, well, it's not so different from now, very um, self-centered in a way. The way the Americans do things is the right way. Yes. Uh, it's the most important country, the most important concerns. And I was very quickly disabused of that notion. So when I came back and I uh, went through the University of Buffalo and also in three years, yes. uh, I sought out international students. I always hung around with them because I felt very deep empathy of what it takes to be the speaker of another language from another culture, trying to make it elsewhere. So that was one very important thing, I think. That's so important you mentioned that. I hope the younger generation do the same, they'll study in abroad. I hope so. I mean, given this last year and so on, that has all come to a, a stop. But I always urge young people, if they can, especially after they finish high school, before they start college, to go abroad or after they finish college, before they go to graduate school, take a year off. It's just a mind expander. Yeah. And then when I was 19, I went and I was going to spend the summer in Israel working on a kibbutz. Mm -hmm. I ended up staying there a year and a half. So that was another dimension of international living. Yes. And I think that uh, may have indirectly led to my more recent, I've been teaching in Paris now, for 20 years, just a few days a, a year. And the three years I spent in Denmark also teaching yes. at the business school there. So um, I'm very sensitive to what's required of, of that. Yes. Uh, and what I mean by being uh, part of the fortunate generation, when I came to Cornell, it was in 76, 1976, yes. it was to pursue a PhD in comparative literature. Um, I thought I knew French and German and Hebrew. Little did I realize that as a graduate student in that area, you have to actually know how to write and, and do scholarly research in all those languages. And I was just a fluent, I was a speaker pretty much. Yes, and it yes. also was the time in the mid, uh, mid seventies when theory, took prominence over content. The whole academic world was shifting yeah. and I, I didn't like it as much. I, I loved reading and I loved books and I didn't want to ruin that. So uh, I dropped out. I started doing commercials on television. I was younger. Yes, exactly. You have and so many areas. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So there were commercials. I did acting and then I became a journalist uh, and did that for eight years and I was news director of a radio station. I learned on the job and that's what I mean about being able to walk into something. Yeah. And as far as I'm concerned, having real life experience uh, is, I, I don't want to say more valuable. I do teach at a university, but it is extremely valuable for actually learning how a profession works. Yes. And um, then I uh, had a daughter and the same year, uh, Cornell sold its radio stations. So I resigned. I didn't uh, like the direction it was going. And I got a call from a friend I had known from PhD days who said, quick, quick, someone has uh, walked off the job in the business school because she didn't like her office. Can you come teach a writing mm -hmm. course? And that was 35 years ago. And I've been at Cornell ever since. And that's where you landed and you are till today. Yep how life goes in directions. Exactly. Never know. But your experience, your early experience abroad 
that may be also strong to you know take on challenges whatever comes in life i think you're right i think you're right juliana yep yep i hope i hope the younger generation will listen to that and also especially those who are lucky enough to study abroad i feel once they come back home mm-hmm. they just cut off this you know connecting with international people and go back again to their usual normal um. life and mingling just with the locals and mm. i think it's important to keep that as you mentioned you came back and you were automatically searching for international yep. people international college students around you wanted to keep that and yes i think that's important otherwise you lose it yes exactly exactly or otherwise you go through life unchanged exactly if impressions like that don't change the way you think about things or view other people then you haven't experienced it right exactly yeah. and uh, as i mentioned at the beginning you are also an entrepreneur so how so this is something i'm very interested in i'm really thinking whether it's a coincidence being you know in 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 the educational sector and dealing with communication which is expressing yourself mm. but art is also a, a way of expressing yourself mm. just differently it's also communicating mm-hmm. was that a coincidence or is there any background story i know your your dad was right exactly my uh-huh. father was an abstract expressionist painter in buffalo and he was well known in the western new york region uh so i never did um he that was his territory so i did other things and i never painted i loved drawing and uh, everything as a child most kids do but i pursued uh, the more academic life yes uh, and then because of the experiences i told you when i um quit the radio station i then also ran for office uh 3 years later and i was involved in politics for 12 years and this one year 1999 i founded the light and winter festival and started painting as well as as teaching and being on the county board those were a couple very busy years those were those were too much for some reason that was the year it may have been my age i don't know yes but but it was a very mysterious experience uh i had started sewing i sewed a different dress for every county board meeting i started painting glassware so there was clearly something that wanted to come out yes the creativity side yes. from the yes. first day from the family exactly and one morning <laughs> i woke up a winter morning when i was on break from teaching and i had this insatiable desire to paint wow. i cannot explain it i it really was weird so i ruined a couple pads of watercolor paper I got a couple lessons from a friend of mine on how to render. I I had a natural ability, I think. And then I um took some targeted workshops over the years on how to use um different mediums. Uh but I taught myself and I insisted on painting representational things. Uh actually everything it started with F, flowers, fruit, figures, uh and just to prove that I could. And then um I was doing cloudscapes and seascapes, you know, clouds and the ocean yeah. and the horizon, and I got rid of the horizon line, and that was abstract painting. And from then on, uh I've been very happy in the world of um balancing color and line and texture. And you didn't plan that, isn't it? It was just a flow in life. You yeah. It was the closest as I've ever come to a calling. <laughs> it felt like I had to do it. Yes. yes. that's so interesting. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. And you know, Juliana, you made the uh, either the connection or the difference between the two fields. Exactly. I think I I I know that there's no intentional crossover except for um using metaphors. Yes. So when I'm teaching, I often and I'm dealing with one of the most common speaking problems, which is speaking too quickly. I often use the metaphor of white space in a painting. If you have something on a in a drawing or a painting that is surrounded or offset by blank canvas that lets you focus on 
what you've drawn or painted. And in speaking, unless you have white space, unless you pause yes. and let what you say sink in, then people will not understand it. So I think that's a useful crossover metaphor. Okay. But other than that, painting for me is just uh, a refuge from thinking. <laughs> your, your psychic space you find, yes, as you meant. That's so beautiful, wonderful. Well, let's 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 go to the the heart of the matter. The, yes. Exactly, <laughs> being a lecturer. Can you unravel any misconceptions of your work? Let's let's say first of all as a lecturer. And the faculty you te you teach, are there any any misconceptions for cross-cultural communication? Maybe because I think for most people hearing cross-cultural communication, they think it's about country, cross cross-country communication. Is there can you can you help us unravel misconceptions? I wouldn't be so bold as to call it misconceptions only because a lot of people deal in that world about yeah. and produce books on how to deal with every country in Europe and then Asia yeah. and the, the cultural history and the norms and how to deliver a business card and so on. Yeah. And that's fine, especially yeah. for very quick little uh, tips on how not to embarrass yourself if you're going yes. abroad. Yes. But for me, um, it's much deeper than that. And I think that there are different ways of being in the world that are can be related to your cultural context, mm -hmm. the way people behave and expectations, but also your own personality. That's why there are always so many exceptions to the generalities and yes. why I do not like to deal in, in cultural stereotypes. Yes. There's always somebody who, uh, who uh, defies that. And so I think there are, my approach to cross-cultural communication is to um, emphasize different uh, personalities and the way your style of communication is and see how that relates to or defies the culture you're in. So for example, um, there's something called uh, a social style approach, which is yeah. what I use in my interpersonal and cross-cultural communication yeah. classes, which is based on, not on how um, how you define yourself, but how other people see you. Uh, sometimes you come across in a way that you're not aware of. Yes. And yes. problems yes. might ensue if you're not uh, clear on what kind of uh, communicator you are. Yes. So when and I first. Wonder, and you wonder why are there always problems? Because you exactly. see it differently. Yeah. Exactly because other people think and act differently. Yeah. So if I'm, for example, I took the test and um, I'm an expressive. Now I had always thought of myself as a uh, related uh, type, a driver. And I remember that from my political days, have a goal, get things done, fast, efficient. That may be true, but I'm also, I use my hands, uh, I have an animated style and if I just thought that that is the way everyone should be, then that's what I would be teaching in business school. The American style, the strong, firm handshake, the outgoing, the this and yeah. that. But other people are not like that. Some people are uh, very conscious of everyone in the room yeah. and want to make sure that there's no conflict, everything gets done, slower pace. Some people are very analytical. They need to know all the details before, not only before they make a decision, but before they even voice an opinion. So you can see what happens in the workplace when there's a, a, a dynamic or expressive uh, person running the meeting and there are people who just aren't contributing. contributing. Yes. And the temptation is to think, oh, they're not interested. Yes. Oh, they're kind of dumb. assume very quickly. Exactly. Yeah. And it's true, it's true. And the reality is they're just trying to think of how to express it best or to get more information before they say something. So yeah. being aware of those differences, I think, is is one of the best elements of cross-cultural communication. Of course. Oh, wonderful. Beautiful. Who should... So 
Actually, I should have asked the question before talking about cross-cultural communication, because I was thinking maybe what is it actually? What is communication? Mm. Before going into all these nuances, so interpersonal mm -hmm. communication, cross-cultural communication, how can we define communication without using, you know, the if, if I would now search in a, in a dictionary, what, right. what would be there? How will you say, if someone asks, what is it actually communication? That is, that's a lovely question, actually, because it's the, it is the question. Yes. And I've actually never thought about it before, and I've never looked up the, the definition. Yes. To me, I think of it in terms of effective communication is having something interesting to say, being able to say it well, and being able to listen and to respond. And that, to me, is the most important thing. Uh, and the key to success, I think, for anyone is to listen, listen. and actually listen. Be present. Don't wait silently thinking about what you're going to say next. Actually listen to what you're hearing and respond to that. And that was a through line, actually, Juliana, if I think about it now, from being an analyst of literature, yes. to being a journalist, to being a politician, to being an entrepreneur. Yes. Throughout all of that, clear, concise, and compassionate communication yes. is the most important thing. And so difficult. The most yes. important thing and yet so difficult. Why is that, do you think? Why do you think it's difficult? That's such a good question. I've been thinking, well, what you mentioned before with the culture, it's difficult because I think it depends also on the socioeconomic background you come from. Yes. And, and as you mentioned, first of all, the identity, ideology, mm -hmm. agenda, how mm -hmm. I've been brought up. And am I eloquent? Am I Am I having all the vocabulary to express myself the way I would like to? Mm -hmm. Am I having the education to be able to even do so? Am I having the awareness to see, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. are these people perceiving me as the way I think I am? Mm -hmm. Am I gesticulating, which has uh, probably for someone who is an introvert, is just too mm -hmm. much? So they, yeah. they just, you know, I don't want, it, it's really not easy. And to think of all these areas within, how long, how long does a sentence, a short sentence uh, last? Yeah. Then many think of all these things and try to make it right. It's not easy. You know, Juliana, the way you're describing things, feels to me like someone who's trying to learn a new sport and is over conscious of every single gesture, how you hold the club, how you stand. When you get good, you forget about all the little things. And I think there are some similarities with effective communication, especially with presenting. Yes. A lot of people get up in front and it's a very frightening thing for everybody, no matter what nationality. Yes. Uh, Americans are just as, as terrified yes. and you get up and you start concentrating okay don't twist my ring don't touch my face um, don't rock back and forth yes. all these little things and my advice to people like that who get over concerned about the little stuff is concentrate on what you're saying yes. concentrate on the content of what you're saying and look around and see how people are receiving it do you see somebody looking puzzled, looking bored? Don't take it personally. They may be thinking about their own life, but concentrating on what you're saying puts all the other things by the wayside. And then gestures are natural. And then the way you're speaking is necessary to get across what you're saying instead of over concentrating on how all these different factors make up an effective communicator. It's so true. So having the social awareness, it's so true. What you just said reminded me of uh, my, my, I think my second or third guest was Anthony Scaramucci. And uh, he was, and even if, if it was for a short time, he was a yes. communication director. Yes. 
And and I ask him, I ask him about communication. I didn't go in depth like I want to do with you, but he gave a short anecdote of um, when he was at his conference here in Singapore. And that mm-hmm. exactly happened to him because he got a list of paper. Don't do this. Don't say that. Don't move there. Don't, don't, don't. And he said he's actually very confident in speaking. But at once he stood there because he had all these rules, don't end and end. He wasn't, he wasn't himself anymore. Yes, and then okay. he thought, wait, wait a minute. I am here. People here know I'm an American. And they they are expecting me to be American and not to yeah. be like, you know, yeah. the way yeah. one should be here in Singapore. And he said, and then he thought, no, I can't do this because it's not me. It's no more me. I can't do this. I have to be authentic. Yes. And I, and I can only be good in what I do if I if am. You are to be. And it's true what you just, it, it's true. And in That's his, very interesting. That, that, I thought that was very interesting when, when he mentioned that short story. That's right. That's but right. Home, we, we are all learning. Yeah. We're all learning. Yeah. yeah. I would like to um, dive deeper into this communication. I have to say it's also a bit self, selfish. I love this topic <laughs> and I want to know more. So. Yeah. Your, I know your focus is on intercultural communication, leadership, persuasion, as I mentioned at the beginning, which are all essential aspects of success in any field, mm-hmm. in life in general. And communication is a huge field and, and for me so fascinating. But today I would like to focus on intercultural communication. What are, and we've mentioned already some, but I would like to know that from you again, also for the audience, especially for the younger generation, what are the main challenges we have if communicating across cultures? Mm -hmm. We are working with global people in a global world. My neighbor may be from another country Mm -hmm. at work. So I think if you could help us, what, what, what are the main challenges when we communicate across cultures? One, don't make assumptions. Don't make lazy assumptions that you know why someone is acting the way he or she is. And that goes for whether it's uh, someone from another national culture or not. You just cannot make assumptions. You need to ask and you need to be respectful and figure out what's going on. So that's one thing. That's, again, we go back to these um, cultural stereotypes that are still in existence that need to be overcome, especially because um, people of goodwill are trying to come together. So people from many countries see uh, English as the global language, Uh, Western business culture as the dominant culture, so they try to fit in. Uh, Some American business people do try, as we said in the beginning, to avoid the grossest kinds of errors and that are unwittingly or, you know, that you can learn how not to do. But in terms of actually relating to other people, um, going in with the assumption that everyone has the same goodwill that everybody wants to accomplish what you're trying to accomplish. And that if there are differences in getting there, you're gonna take the time to figure out what they are and to resolve them as opposed to just pushing ahead. That's that's one thing, don't make assumptions. And the other is the the subset is to be patient, you know? Um, That's that's one thing most- And that's a hard one. It's a hard one for people uh, I, I dare say, like us, yes. who are quick and uh, efficient and like to see things done. And I've learned very valuable lessons over the years on how important dealing with other personality types is to actually getting the best result and the best kind of uh, outcome that you're looking for. Yes. Listening to someone who says, whoa, 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 slow down. Uh, 
did you proofread this? Did yeah. you actually think about this? And I learned through hard experience, through all these various things that I've done, that uh, the truth of what I'm saying, yeah. at least it's my own truth, yeah. um, that, that being careful, being respectful, being patient, these are all rules for living, not just communication, right. but communication is part of it. And I love what you said before about authenticity. I think that's extremely important. You can, and in fact, that's what um, part of the cross-cultural uh, class that I did for Cornell is about, the web, the e-Cornell class. Yes, yes. Is that um, being authentic is staying true to who you are. Communicating can be changed. You can soften the rough edges yeah. of how what your natural tendency wants you to do. So instead of speaking at a very high volume when you're used to, is speaking a little more quietly. Is instead of um, jumping in and finishing somebody's sentences, which to you is a sign of um, interest and validation, to somebody else is very insulting. You're cutting off what they have to say. So don't do that, you know? Yeah. So those are communication things that can be modified without changing who you are. We just have to be aware of our tendencies. And exactly. and like, not easy, not easy. Exactly. It's a skill. We but can it can be. be. Yeah, yeah. Patience, awareness, respect. Yes, exactly. Listen and really listen, not just the hearing. Right, right. Actually listen and listen. That's what I said about communication being a, a through line through all these other professions, like being a journalist. When I'd interview people, especially people in politics, what are they not saying, right? What, what, what is the subtext? What is the subtext message that's not being said? When I was a politician and people would talk to me, it was a matter of uh, controlling the message of not just going off and blabbering, but being concise because you need to get across what you want to get across. And all of that experience yeah. actually was formative in my attitudes about cross-cultural communication. And probably because of your traveling at early age and, and living abroad, you, yep. you had already those alarm signals to be exactly. aware and then wait and see, which exactly. is the reason why it's important if you have the chance and 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 the possibility to travel then one should do especially the younger yeah. ones. you know you've mentioned the younger generation many times and i think we are going i'm so looking forward if i'm still around to a much better future with the younger generation now at least from what i can see they are growing up without a lot of the damaging attitudes that my generation had and even the generation after. They're growing up with an expectation of equality and equity. Yes. That I find very thrilling. Yes. So I have a lot and, of hope for that. And also very, very aware of, of the environment. All these, yes. this younger generation is much more into yes. that and aware of it. Well, let's not give up the hope. Is there is there another example we can use to showcase or, or any relevant things happening to really showcase how difficult it is to communicate across cultures? Because sometimes we've mentioned now maybe cultures, uh, different cultures than one is used to, but sometimes we speak the same language and yet it can be difficult yes. to yes. understand yes. each other it's and you know speaking the same language so one good example i know we've we've talked offline about yes. is uh was the recent oprah interview of exactly. megan and harry exactly. so speaking the same language gets rid of all the issues of um, understanding or misunderstanding the words, yes. Yes. but that was a cross-cultural communication exercise that was received very differently very by different. different types of people, right? Yes. So Meghan Markle 
was so American, was so frank and open in a way that shocked English viewers. Exactly. Absolutely. What a great example. And I, I hope that's why I'm trying to get relevant examples or current examples that people understand exactly what you mean. It's, it, it can even happen in the apparent same language. Exactly, exactly. But so when you, culture. Right. And um, Oprah, Oprah is a, is a, I mean, she's a remarkable woman and a, a very interesting interviewer. And her technique is to embody the Vox Populi, right? Yeah. So when she, you know, she knows a lot more than she lets on. Exactly. And so when, when Megan says something, she said, what? what? You know? <laughs> the shock of the nation, you know? So it's a very, it's a, it's a marvelous technique because people felt their jaws drop or whatever. But uh, Harry is in an interesting position there uh, as being the representative Brit who comes from his own culture, which yeah. is pretty unusual. Not everybody is a prince. Exactly. And, and there are expectations for the royal family or for the firm that are even more different from the yes. British population. That, I love so, That's so it, fascinating, isn't it? It's mm -hmm. so fascinating. Speaking the same language, they were all speaking English. But yep. these differences and how these differences lead to misunderstanding. Yes, yes. Wonderful. Great example. I hope it was clear now for those who may not, you know, get it. Yes, that cross-cultural communication is not a matter of language. It's a matter of attitude, receptivity, and cultural backgrounds. And cultural. That is what cross-cultural communication is, not Beautiful just a language. Example. Thank you so much for taking that example. I'm coming now to the, which actually, it matches perfectly, to global cultural awareness, which I would like to promote through this mm. whole series. Mm -hmm. How do you address that in your faculty? Global cultural awareness to the students, especially to the local students, because you have also international students. Mm -hmm. Do you implement that? Do you talk about that within this um, within this lecture, Global Cultural Awareness? I teach in person, or in this case, Zoom, this year. Um, I, I've never, I teach interpersonal communication, management presentations, and I've done this E. Cornell course on cross-cultural, which is a subset of interpersonal. Yes. So in all of those areas, things I've learned along the way have been um, trying to find the right balance between defining, <clears throat> excuse me, defining someone yes. as other and pretending that uh, difference doesn't exist, right? So yeah. early on in my teaching career, I, I had a lot of control over what courses I was doing. And I was doing a writing course, just writing. And I thought, well, why don't we try to have uh, a writing section just for international students, as if there's such a thing as an international student. Yeah. Students from Mexico, Argentina, Singapore, yeah. China, Korea, I mean, yeah. everywhere, Brazil. Uh, there are some common linguistic and writing uh, issues that uh, cross a lot of countries, but others are very different. And I did that once and never again, because it was, it ran counter to what the students wanted to get by studying here. They want to be with Americans. Yeah. They want to make American or other international friends. Yeah. Uh, they want to learn the idiom. And when yeah. you're segregated that way, even though it was done with a good intention, uh, it backfired. It was not a good thing. So I make an effort now in all of my classes when I uh, deliver what is considered an American style uh, approach to either presenting or communicating, 
I make a point of asking students from other cultures not to represent their entire nation, but to say, what is the norm there? How would this be felt in Korea? How would this be felt in Brazil? And sometimes there are commonalities and sometimes there aren't. And so American students are then made more aware of the effort that international students have to make to fit in, to be part of the gang, and to overcome their own uh, styles. I hope other lecturers are listening too. (laughs) I love that. Very good. Yes, that's a good way to promote global cultural awareness. Wonderful. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love that. I could, I could ask so much. It's so fascinating. It's so fascinating. You ask wonderful questions. I must say, it's really a pleasure to discuss this, this with you. I love I that. Have a chance Thank to do that. <laughs> I, I love that. I could learn so much from you, all of us, many of us. Yeah. Well, soft skills is a vital part of this whole series and also to me very important. And mm-hmm. we are actually talking the whole time about soft skills. What we are doing right now is soft skills. And I want to know how, of course, how soft skills play a role in your daily life as a colleague but also as a teacher. Mm. How vital are soft skills for you? They are so vital that I am, would like to found a movement to stop calling them soft skills. Yes. Because, yes. because it feels like it's that's put aside is, is what the girls do. And the finance and the marketing and everything else in business and, and cutthroat uh, competitiveness and so on, that's really important. The soft skills help. The reality is what we think or what are termed soft skills are the most desired achievements when it comes to uh, business hiring. They are in the top five, presenting, interpersonal, critical thinking, ethics, uh, there's one more. Those are the top five. The skills that you can learn in a classroom or through experience in the in the work world are things that are easily taught. Soft skills are the hardest thing because they involve your own identity. And that's why they're so frightening for so many people. That's why um, in this country, at least, public speaking is number three on the horror scale after snakes and spiders. You know, people are so afraid to get up in front of other people or to raise their hand in a meeting, lest they be judged, lest they make a mistake. And depending on how you were brought up and your own level of self-confidence, uh, it's a very difficult thing. So I, I wish, Juliana, you could think of another name and I will help spread it for soft skills because they are the bedrock of how we are in the world. So I find it very important. When I was in politics, I learned patience. Um, When I was a journalist, my um, quickness and sharpness was seen as a a benefit. Uh, It would scare wrongdoers. I could get a good story. When I was a politician, I was chair of the county board and I was not elected by the people. I was elected by my colleagues of different parties. So learning how to um, set expectations for everyone, regardless of who they were, being compassionate, letting people speak, but not blather, knowing when to cut them off. Those were all the most valuable skills I learned as a politician, not how to manage a budget, which I also knew how to do, you know, not how to do other things, but that aspect. So I have been so fortunate in being able to have a career in academia that lets me deal specifically with those issues. Um, I'm very fortunate. (laughs) Thank you so much. Amen, amen, amen to what you just said about soft skills. I am so grateful you mentioned that because this part is so important and we will use that too in the workshops. And you, you really mentioned something so true about the world. We should find something else to describe these skills, today's hard skills soft and actually i'm very surprised 
you see that as a Westerner, the same as her. here in Asia, huh. perceived. I thought always, oh no, it's it, it's just in Asia where they think, oh, soft, soft. This is the word soft is not good at all. It doesn't. It doesn't. If you say you have soft skills, it doesn't sound good. In right. You. Right. Soft. It doesn't sound good at all. And I thought right. that's an Asian thing. And I'm so glad you. It, it, that's why. Amen. Amen. I can sign that. I'm so glad you mentioned it. And you see that the same way. It's the absolutely. Way, which is disturbing. Which which may give people a false um, yes. idea of yes. what it is. Yeah, maybe a someone deal and a lack of respect. Yeah, yeah. Maybe someone will come up with another word. Yes, ask one of your viewers. We'll take all suggestions. We'll ask that. To wrap up, and I would like to continue because I really love this topic. It's so fascinating and I want to learn more and hear from you. But, well, we have to somehow go on. To wrap up this whole cross-cultural communication from you as an expert, we are lucky to have you here. What one message or important tip would you give us along the way? Listen. Wow. That really is, is really is it. Listen. Communication, everyone thinks, is about talking. It's about persuading. It's about moving. It's about influence. Of course, those are the results. The only way you can really, in my opinion, be an effective communicator is to listen and respond appropriately. Be in the moment, bring everything you have to the moment. Listen and respond. Listen, the lost link in a loud world. Listen. <laughs> Ooh, nice. Listen. Thank you so much, thank you. We'll come now to your reflection on 2020 it has been such a difficult year for many 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 and it's still going on yeah. can you share with us when you look back how it was for you professionally mm -hmm. especially mm -hmm. in the educational sector mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in late february of 2020 i was um, teaching in Paris. I mentioned that I, I go there every year and stay yes. with friends. Yes. And yes. I was there and we were watching. My friend is French. Her husband is Italian. She teaches Spanish. They live in Paris. So this is truly uh, an intercultural family there. And we would watch the news and about what was happening in Italy with the pandemic. Exactly. Ooh, how terrible. Wow. Yeah. No one thought it was going to be yeah. what it turned out to be. I was, I had a, a two days of illness there. Um, terrible cough uh, that lasted for a couple of weeks, like I've never had. I don't know what it was. It may not have been, but I flew home on a plane and I thought, oh, how lucky. I have a whole middle row to myself. The plane was half empty. It never occurred to me that this is when things were speeding up and people were canceling their flights. I was in class. We had started the second, uh, we were in the second week of teaching and we were shut down that week. So we had one week of live and then we went to Zoom. And I was very, um, never having done it before, I wasn't bitter, but I was suspicious. I thought, oh my God, we're going to lose all the kind of um, connection you have in the classroom, the Exactly. The glances, the faces, this. Yes. And then it turned out to be, once I rallied, it turned out to be very effective. It turned out to work. Yes, there was some loss, but there was also some gain. There's the difficulty of Zoom because of the lag, because of the freezing, because of the uh, seeing yourself. Yes. So much in a way yes. that we never so see. Much. Exactly, exactly. It's, it's abnormal yes. and so it's very exhausting and and yes. weird and yes. there's a lot of cosmetic surgery going on as a result oh really but, <laughs> no it's time for that okay yeah right yes no but uh <laughs> but i got used to it and um i've really enjoyed it this past semester and now 
And next fall, I think it's going back to normal and I'm looking forward to that. But what I've noticed is the resiliency, especially of my students, to showing up for this and giving it all they have instead of uh, sulking or being yeah. resentful. Yeah. Um, nobody's happy, but people have made the best of it. And this is in my, and I started out this conversation acknowledging my privilege, okay? I'm a very fortunate person. So I live in a college town where uh, people are relatively safe, where I had the means to work from home, where I didn't have to go in the way other people at Cornell do. So um, for me, uh, the morning is for everyone else. And for the, and the anger is for the bad response. And the compassion is for uh, people who have really suffered. So it's been a tumultuous year, very difficult year. What has it been like for you? Well, we so have, have to <laughs> I, ha I have to say we had two and a half months real lockdown, yeah. but, but people are resilient here and they listen and um, that helps. So life, I can also say, I, I feel fortunate too to live here because we still had our life going on just yes. you know yes. mass and and follow the rules and all yes. and i have to say and that would have been my next question to you how how was it for you personally i realized oh i'm actually someone who is always in doing in doing doing yes this is the time where i i started observing things i would never do because i just didn't have that much time to observe myself Right. And I realized I'm always in doing, in doing. And I thought, oh, that's something you need to work on and, you know, back off it. You don't have to just be. And it was, it was good for me. It was, it was. Mm -hmm. But yeah. as I said, everyone is um, in another situation and in, in a different phase of life mm -hmm. and also financially, which, which can also right. make you... Yes, so that would have been my next question to you. So personally, how was it for you? And, and at the end of the day, what matters in life? Hmm. Hmm. <clears throat> I remember, well, one thing that um, consumed us in March and April was that our daughter, who's in New York City, who's a mu musical theater pianist and vocal coach, uh, came down oh, with a very okay. bad... Oh yeah, oh yeah, and an artist and a writer. She's she's a remarkable woman. So she came down with a very bad case of COVID. And that was frightening because at that point, uh, nobody was going anywhere. And I, my instinct was to zip down to New York City and bring her back and she would not allow it and nor would the law. So it was very hard being away from somebody who was so ill. And she never went to the hospital, couldn't have gotten in anyway. And she recovered and there are still things, but she's fine. So that was a very consuming thing. And I remember um, not painting for literally two months. I would just go to bed and wake up, waiting for it to be over, thinking, okay, now it's over, now it's over. And then I realized, no, it's not. And it was a real psychological reframing. Yes, I finally yes. got up and said, it's not going to change. I have to continue. Yes. But yes. what you just said was is very resonant. I didn't feel I had to continue with all the lunches, with people I didn't really know, yes. really want to see. Uh, it was much more obviously home-based, my husband and I, yes. and teaching on Zoom and being able to paint like crazy. Yes, so yes. the gallery has an open house coming up and it's everything in there is what I've done in the last year. And so it was a very um, productive oh, period of time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's an aside. A gift. Precious. Yes. Life. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That was the gift. That's right. Beautiful. Thank you for sharing. Well, what's next? What's on the horizon for Barbara? Maybe as a visiting lecturer to Singapore? 
Oh, would I love that, Juliana? I would love that. I have two friends from Singapore, from the university, who are in my professional organization, the Management Communication Association, and I look forward to seeing them every year, only once a year. So yeah. I'd love to go to Singapore and see them there. <laughs> yeah. Who knows? Who knows what's on the horizon? Any right. plans? Any plans, or there are no plans? No immediate plans. I have to get into speaking of resilience, realizing that. I'm now vaccinated, as is my husband, and I'm going to be able to see uh, family in other places soon, which is my biggest plan. Yes. Professionally, to continue in painting and teaching. Wonderful, and you love you love doing that. I you do. Love I love both, actually. I really do. One is not a a refuge from the other. It's uh, okay. parallel loves. Yes, I can see in your passion. Okay, to conclude this whole fireside chat, I've prepared some fun quiz. That's always the surprise, but it's really just fun and for our leaderboard. Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> Wonderful. The first question is always um, industry related. The second one is just a general trigger question, and the third one is more about fast thinking. So the okay. first one: What does shaking the head left and right in India mean? Yes. yes, maybe or no? Yes. 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 Correct. Which country was the Caesar salad invented in? My tendency, I want to say Italy, only because of Caesar, but I don't know. I thought California because I think that's in Berkeley where I first uh, uh -huh. had the salad. It's in Mexico. It's the border. Oh. Tijuana, the border to to uh, San Diego, and and oh, that was California. Yes, it was an Italian yeah. name called Caesar. Yeah, yeah. And now it's the fast thinking. Name me within five seconds as many budget airlines as possible. Five. Ryanair, uh, Southwest, JetBlue. That's it. <laughs> yeah, we got three. Wonderful. We got three at the first question. Correct. Four points. Wonderful. We are coming to an end, Barbara. Do you like coffee? Perfect. So what's your go-to coffee order? Large, dark roast, French, no milk, no sugar. Oh, straight to, straight to the veins. Nice. And uh, you know, baristas, according to a barista, one can reveal your personality by your coffee order. Oh, really? I should put that in with the, uh, the, the cross-cultural communication, defined by coffee. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you so much. Thank you for having you here. I'm, I'm so excited and I would like to learn so much from you. We, we can all learn a lot from you. It's, it was it's, a pleasure to connect with you, Juliana. It, I love honor. that conversation. It's an honor for me to have you here. Thank you so much for taking the time too. Thank you, Juliana. Thank you. Best Be pleasure. safe. Be safe. Be well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. 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 For the viewers who tuned in, I hope you enjoyed this edition of Cross-Cultural Communication. Although communication is the basis of human being, and no doubt it plays a vital role in human life, we often struggle to communicate our ideas effectively, especially even more across cultures. Let's pay more attention, have an open mindset, be tolerant, be patient towards non-mother tongue speakers. This way, we will master not only how to communicate effectively, but also efficiently, empathetically, and work with anyone from anywhere. Thank you for joining me. I hope to see you again. Stay tuned.